This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead. And that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. You know, after this uh, last conference, True Legends Conference, God's kind of done something in me. I've become more aware of the hour in which we live and a more determination to see the remnant awakened, more in, in just, just to endeavor to see not only them awakened, but how many know that just being awakened does not mean you're empowered? To see them empowered, in fact, Steve said something during his presentation that really resonated with me. He talked about the need for functional faith. And the moment he said that, I thought of the CCW class I was going through. And, and, you know, sometimes it can be small things that really throw you up and keep you from moving in your faith the way you need to. And the instructor talked about this one man that he finally, he had carried his handgun for months and finally took it to a range again to, to fire it, and it wouldn't fire. And it startled him because he had been carrying it for personal protection. And when you take it out to the range, it won't fire and a little bitty, itty bitty speck of brass had gotten into where it was in front of the firing pin and it was causing it not to fire. And we're getting into the days that we're going to need to learn how to pray some Davidic prayers. You know, the book of Psalms was not only their psalm book, I'm realizing it was their spiritual warfare book. And I mean, there's some strong prayers in the book of Psalms that'll take paint right off a wall. Though the one who wrote a lot of those was the one who took down a lion, took down a bear, and Goliath was no different. But you ha you've got to have things in line before you start praying those kind of prayers. We can't do it childishly. We cannot do it arrogantly. That there's, we basically need to get our stuff together. We need to grow up. And so thinking about that and thinking about we were having so many no, new listeners. We're actually on several new radio stations now. This is not only being converted for, for video, for TV, but we can take the exact same sound files, and we have probably about 10 or 11 uh, podcast internet stations that are picking it up, that are rebroadcasting it. And so you don't really know where everybody is. And so I wanna, I'm going to kind of do a mini-series with an understanding of the kingdom, but it's still about the kingdom. And we're going to be talking about kingdom foundations and functional faith. Because there are some things in the Word that if you don't have in line, your prayers don't work. There's some things if you don't have in place, you may find yourself more like the seven sons of Sceva than you do the Apostle Paul or Peter when you're confronted with evil. Last thing you want is to find out. You don't want to say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, that Mike Lake and Steve Quayle and, and Tom Horn and all those preach. You better know who Jesus is and he better be ruling and reigning in your life. It's that personal relationship. One of the things that I shared down there, there's a paradox about delegated authority. You can only move in kingdom authority to the same extent that you bow your knee to the king. And so if you refuse to bow, don't be surprised if when you use the name of Jesus against the enemy, they refuse to bow. 
They'll look you right in the face and say, you won't do it. Why do you expect me to do it? And so if you have your Bibles today, I want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 and 21. And I don't, know, I'm gonna, I don't even know how far I'm going to get my notes. I have 48 minutes for us to record for TV, so I'll just put a pen when we get to that time, and we'll just keep on going in the next session. But I'm going to cover a lot of Scriptures in the New Testament that you hardly ever hear ministers today comment on. They would rather gloss over them and act like they didn't exist, kind of like a lot of people do with Genesis 6. They just kind of gloss over it, not realizing when you read the story of Noah, you start in Genesis 6 and you read through Noah, that's over a thousand years of human history. And we just glance over it like it's nothing. Well, it, it caused God to become catastrophic in his, in his reaction. I think it's important. And there's some, some important things here. Now, 2 Timothy, I can see, is a very critical epistle for the Apostle Paul. It was the last epistle he wrote. In fact, historians will tell us that he finished 2 Timothy the night before he lost his life for the gospel. So when he's telling Timothy, keep the faith, you know, preach, and all the, in fact, a preacher's char charge is taken out of 2 Timothy. Because he said, listen, I've run the race, I've fought the fight, I don't have anything less, left to do. In fact, historians will tell you that when it came time for him, for when Nero was executing him, that he ran to the executioners. He was ready to go home. And you can kind of feel that burden in 2 Timothy. This is going to be the last time I write to anybody. And so the, I want you to get it. And so starting in verse 19, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. How many know it's good to know the foundation of God stands in rough times? Now we want to stop right there. Glory to God, the foundation of God stands. I'm on the solid rock, right? I'm on the rock. I'm on the rock. I'm on the solid rock. I don't have to do anything because I believe in the pre-trib rapture and I got this Willy Wonka golden ticket. Don't have to grow. Don't have to do anything. You're just lucky I come here once a week and sit down and listen to what you have to say, preacher. Well, I tell you what, you got a hard road to hoe in the day's head. Now, how does this sure foundation of God, how does it function? It has a seal on the foundation. The Lord knows those that are His. That's awakening. For some, that's going to be a rude awakening. Because they'll say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done this in your name? Have we not done this in your name? And he's going to say, I never knew you. Those that work iniquity, work lawlessness. You can't fool God. He knows those that are his. And let me tell you something. The devil knows those that are his. You can fool yourself, but you can't fool God and you can't fool the devil. God knows those that are his, but there's a second part to this seal. You see, those that God knows and they know God, they live differently. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's on the foundation of the kingdom. Now that goes against everything that's being preached on modern Christian television today. We don't have to worry about sin. Sin was taken care of at the cross. I can live like I want to. Yeah, you can be stuck on stupid if you want to, and the devil's tearing up your life. And you say, well, I just got this Willy Wonka. Well, one of these days when I get to heaven, I'm going to get the victory. That's not what the Word says. We are more than overcomers now. Did you know when you get to heaven, you're not going to have authority over the devil? He's not going to be there. He's not allowed there. Come on now. God knows those that are his, and those that are his depart from iniquity. So a sign 
of the remnant will be they do not do iniquity. They're not motivated by sin. They're looking for a way out of sin, not into sin, nor do they excuse sin. They crucify the sin. And if you don't, we need to ask yourself, do you really know him? Are you being religious? You see, if I have this dynamic relationship with Jesus and that he's my king and I'm bowing my knee to him, what the king doesn't like, I don't like. Some people have a hard time that I don't eat pork or shellfish. I don't because the king doesn't. He doesn't like it. In fact, connected to his second coming, he said, all those that eat swine, I'll judge. Don't want to be there. And I never figured out the house mouse thing until you do enough research. Nobody's going around eating mice. <coughs> in the Greek and mystery, in those that were controlled by the mystery religions, in Babylon, in the Grecian Empire, and in the Roman Empire, house mouse was a delicacy. It was an hors d'oeuvre. Yuck. I mean, if one runs across our floor, gets into our house one way or another, you want to talk about needing to steam the carpets from one into the other. It's, I mean, he cries out even if you don't believe in unclean food. Unclean, you know. But he goes on. Listen to this. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. <coughs> and I've seen a lot of Christians stop right there and say, I guess I'm just the mud pot in the kingdom. Have you heard that? I'm just not going to mount to anything in the kingdom. God has decided that he was going to make me a mud pot. They don't. You know what's important is you keep things in context and keep reading. Okay? Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, what's he talking about? Iniquity. You cleanse yourself from sin... He will be a vessel of honor. The way you live your life, once you accept Jesus, transforms you from being a mud pot to a gold vessel. It's called sanctification. Sanctification and holiness are going to be essential in the days ahead because God's not going to allow his anointing and his and his power to flow through a vessel of dishonor. Now, why is it called a vessel of dishonor? Because the vessel is dishonoring the king by what it is allowing itself to be. Oh, think about that for a minute. You're in God's house. You're in his kingdom. He shed his blood to redeem you, to save you, to cleanse you, and that you don't change anything except what you do one, one part of your weekend. You're in his house, but the way that you live is literally dishonoring the king. That's why sanctification is so important. We don't change the word, the word changes us. We need to be washed by the water of the word. We need to stop allowing our flesh to argue with the word and start crucifying the flesh so that we begin manifesting the word. Watchman Nee, in his book on the ministry of the Word, I said something I thought was phenomenal. He talks about the incarnation and how Jesus was the Word before there was ever a world. He's the living Torah. He's the living Word of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he says, here's the quandary for the believer. We all start out flesh. And, we've, and the task of the Christian is to convert it to Word to be like our Savior. So two things in this verse that are extremely important. God knows those that are His. Those that trust in Him will leave sin behind based on God's commandments. Sanctification is a conscious choice and a process the believer must enter into. Now let's go to 1 John. I love the book of 1 John. The epistles of John are some of the last books written in the entire New Testament. 
He first writes the Gospel of John in his old age. They throw him on the Isle of Patmos for doing it. He then pens the book of Revelation. He writes down what God showed him. And I, I can see John's heart because John's the apostle of love. It's like, ay, 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 I've seen what's coming. i got to prepare the kids. Okay? I mean, he saw some rough stuff. Some stuff that I think he actually, if it wasn't for the grace of God, it was hard for him with his worldview and his paradigm to be able to shape into words to express what he was truly seeing. You know, what would the Apostle John do in the first century? He says, now all the world is watching the Antichrist all at one time and are worshiping him. That was hard to conceive in the first century. Now with smartphones, oh, I mean, just, I'm mesmerized by the world leader. Oh. Oh, Mike, that's stupid. They can't put the stupid thing down long enough to drive their vehicle. That's the major reason for autonomous cars. Did you know that? We can't trust people to drive because they got to text somebody right now. They got to respond to Facebook right now. How many lives have been taken or altered because somebody behind the wheel, and I mean, I, 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 saw, I saw a semi going like this the other day. What was the driver doing? Driving a semi. Is there, so when this super charismatic individual comes that is going to have the million dollar smile that he's going to make the greatest stars of Hollywood look like dim bulbs. And his words are going to be enticing. And you can get him on a smartphone. Anytime he comes on, the world will stop. John saw that. Didn't really know how to articulate. He said, the whole world's going to see this. The whole world, the whole world, the whole world. And so he's looking at all this. He says, my goodness, what am I going to do? 1 John is one of the strongest books in the New Testament. Because this apostle of love says, if you don't do this, you're a liar. How's that for love? If you're not doing this, you don't know him. No, by the way, this is what Messiah does. If it does these things, it's the spirit of Antichrist doing these things. And you better, you better check yourself to make sure who you're moving by. That's all in 1 John. At the same time, it's one of the most victorious books. He that believeth that Jesus is the Christ overcomes the world. Strong, strong book. Well, let's go to 1 John chapter 3. Now, we need to know that lawlessness or iniquity, anomia in the Greek, literally means to stand against God's law. There is no other way of interpreting it. So, an antinomian is one who stands against God's law. And unfortunately, we interpret it as law because that's not really what the Hebrew means. Because of the mindset, when you talk with somebody that's Hebraic, you say law... They start doing this because it brought them freedom. It was given to a free people at Mount Sinai after being delivered from Moses. You, you can't walk in the commandments of God until you've been set free in Jesus. Moses was the, was the Old Testament shadow of that. Now you talk to a Greek or a Roman, law was oppressive. It's hard. Do you know how many laws are in the books in America right now? Do you know there's still laws that if you spit on the, um, spit on the pavement that you could get a, like a $50 fine? And I mean, just some crazy laws. And up in Washington, they're thinking of laws that if, you know, if they wanted to, the average American, the, the good American that's actually trying to be a law-abiding, I guarantee you that there's a rule or regulation that you break every hour. 
because nobody, that's why Congress exempts themselves from all of them. I call that being a dirty dog. If it's good enough for us, it's good enough for yins, okay? Yes, I'm in Ozarkian Ozarkian mode this morning. If If you don't have to abide by it, it's hypocrisy to require somebody else to abide by it. And so laws can be oppressive. In the Greek culture, laws could be oppressive. In the Roman culture, laws could be oppressive. That's why the founding fathers said, listen, here's our law. If a Christian will self-regulate themselves according to God's Word, there's no need for federal and state laws, 90% of them. But they also said the more immoral we become, the more that they will try to legislate morality. And how many know they can't do it? It's even on on the gun rulings. How many know criminals do not obey any laws? That's what it means to be a criminal. They're not going to buy their guns at Walmart or or a hunting store that they got to go through a background check. The guy already has a criminal past. He's on probation. You cannot buy a gun. How do they get it? There are arms dealers in America today. The fourth largest, most well-equipped army resides in America. It's called gangs. They are better equipped than our law enforcement are. Bless their hearts. Our law enforcement need prayer, especially in a lot of areas, with what they're dealing with. They're sitting there with with glocks, and they, they have people with assault weapons coming after them with body armor from head to toe like the police should have. But laws can be oppressive. And so we translate that when we read the Word of God, but literally Torah means the loving instruction of the Father. You know, i got a book in my library. It says, eat this, don't eat this. It's talking about being healthy. And, and nobody ever gets mad at that guy for saying, don't eat this, eat this instead. But we get mad at God. Or God says, don't do this, it's sin. It opens up the door to the evil one in your life. As the people of God were coming out of Egypt, they they had a slave mindset. They were a slave to sin. They were a slave to the Egyptians. How do you transform them into a nation walking with God? So God promised, meditate on my commandments day and night. If you do, you're going to make your way successful. You're going to learn how to think like someone dwelling in the kingdom and not like an Egyptian slave. And we've got to realize that God is calling us to walk differently. There are powers, there's power in the commandments of God. Now listen to what John's, 1 John chapter 3, starting with verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness or iniquity. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has not seen him nor known him. And so when you have a lot of believers that there's nothing different in their lives, they sin all day long, don't have a problem with it. Now let me, let me, let me throw this in here. What's the difference between a Christian in bondage and a non-believer acting like a believer? The non-Christian has no conviction of the sin that's in their life. A true Christian, if they're in bondage or backslidden, are the most miserable creatures on the face of the earth. Come on now, because they're under conviction of the Holy Spirit. Get this out before this really messes you up. What did Jesus say anytime he healed somebody? You're healed, your sins are forgiven, now go and don't sin anymore unless something worse comes on you. The sin opened up the door for the bad, and the sin, once you get the bad out and you get Jesus deals with you, Okay, the devil says, okay, paper chains didn't work. Next time I'm going to bring bands of iron to put around you. I'm just waiting for you to open the door by not living the way God wants you to live. Part of spiritual maturity, sanctification, is learning how to walk in these things. This is something that Hebrew roots need to understand. 
because there's a whole debate over circumcision again. I'm thinking, we, we settled that 2,000 years ago, didn't we? There was actually a council in Jerusalem, those that were personally trained by Jesus. And did you know for Gentiles not to be circumcised is very Torah? Because after God circumcised their flesh and they, they went and rejected him and did a bunch of stuff anyway, why did God say, oh, that I would have circumcised your hearts instead of your flesh? At that moment, Almighty God was wishing he was on the other side of the cross too. Because it's the heart circumcision that matters. 1 Corinthians seven nineteen. Paul's dealing with this again and with those in, in Corinth. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. He wrote that to the Gentiles. How many know the Apostle Paul was a Torah teacher? That's where he had his double PhD. But he taught them through the lens of Messiah and what Messiah had done. The way to functional faith is to become a... In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition defies the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the son of perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand the Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com that's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com that's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.